Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, today we're gonna, yeah, Damien and I are gonna talk about uh, building uh, native solutions, um, um, you know, using some of the technologies like our studio and plumber, but in the context of, uh, of uh, pharma and, and what that entails. So there's some of the things that uh, I really like to share. Um, uh, really quickly, uh, my name is Ayman Wakar. I work at Estellas Pharma. Uh, and my colleague, uh, Damien, who is the VP uh, at Absalon Data Science. Um, together, we're going to talk about some of the things that, uh, uh, you know, as much as possible, as, much, as much as we can share, uh, that we have worked uh, at Estella's. Um, so quickly, just want to get out, you know, some of the legal disclaimer that we're, we're allowed, to, we're supposed to, uh, you know, share with you. Um, but so, so before I, I kind of dive deep into, um, um, you know, what native solutions look like um, and what are the, some of the technology behind it. Uh, it, is, it is important to understand uh, the landscape that we operate in uh, within pharma and what that means. So I really wanted to share uh, some of the business context uh, around uh, what the drivers are of the industry. So if we kind of look at the pharma industry, there are you know, some of the key drivers that could be legal, uh, innovation, R&D, some of them are political. Uh, and social, but when you de when you dive deep from the pharma industry uh, within one particular company and one particular brand, uh, you would also see that there are you know you know quite a few number of drivers such as cost, prevalence of disease, supply side factors. Uh, but one of the key ones that we want to focus on is the customer, and the customer in pharma are usually three: uh, they're the physicians, or, and the payer, or the patients. So. Uh, I work on the commercial side, so while there are many factors that you know influence uh, these three uh, aspects or, or customers, what we want to focus on is the physician, which is the healthcare provider. So there are multiple factors that influence a healthcare provider to make a decision to prescribe, uh, and uh, you know there are some you know uh, some campaigns, email campaigns, or direct to consumer campaigns, or some social programs. One of the most effective channel is always the sales representative. So just to give you an understanding that a sales representative here, in this case, is a person who physically visits a physician's office and details that physician to share information about uh, the medicine, the drug, and it's, uh, you know, what are the, some of the advantages and how it can add value and, and prolong life and save patients' lives. So in this slide, kind of want to share the, the overall, you know, landscape of drivers at each level. And what we're focus on, focusing on, which is, you know, the biggest one is obviously the industry, uh, but we're trying to be more granular and, and we're looking at just the sales rep. What are the different drivers that ultimately, you know, uh, lead, uh, lead the, the sales rep to make the decisions that they make when they're actually on the, on the ground, on the field? And I also want to kind of uh, highlight that uh, within commercial, you know, the role of uh, data science and whatever machine learning department that you might have you know, we, we are working at probably, you know, some of the granular levels where we're doing forecasting or budget planning and strategic recommendation by, you know, trying to optimize some of these drivers at the most granular level so that we can give the business the most uh, actual insights so that they can uh, then make the best decision. Um, but what I want to highlight is that as large as you might think your department might be within, uh, you know, a pharma company, you're still making a very small contribution to the total number of pieces of information that they use to make a strategic decision. Ideally, we would want to, uh, you know, try to move the company towards more uh, data-driven or analytically-driven company when they're making these strategic decisions, but, you know, we're not there yet. Uh, but it's important to know that even though you might have a very large team, you're making a very small contribution uh, to the number and pieces of information that they're going to use. So therefore, it is very important for your team to get the method of delivery uh, right. And what I mean by that is, to you know, have a, a nice analogy here, where if you're a supplier of a product, you know, you spend a lot of time in processing and packaging, creating the right optimized package, and then you choose a method of delivery, in this case, it could be a truck, to deliver that package to your end customer. And when you choose the right method of delivery, in this case, your product is on time, meets the expectations, you have positive feedback and trust within the supplier, and that results in you know, positive growth. However, if you choose the wrong method of delivery, you'll have your product that's either delayed, not in time, it doesn't meet the expectation, there's a lack of trust, and uh, ultimately lack of adoption of what you're trying to sell. 
similar thing can apply for your data science group, right? So within our team, you know, we're working and making a lot of investments in hiring and you know, uh, expanding our, our analytical and predictive analytics team, uh, focusing a lot on data and ETL processes and automating that end-to-end -end data science flow, uh, and then trying to package all of these insights into visualizations into you know, some products, could be a PowerPoint slide, or could be an Excel chart, and then sharing it with our stakeholders so that they can absorb these insights and you know, make some actionable uh, decisions. So when this process and the method of delivery is, 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 is chosen in the right way, uh, you would see that your, your insights are delivered at the right time, they're actionable, and there's high uh, adoption. And there's also a trust and credibility that's built in between your group and your stakeholders within the company. But when you don't have this, uh, you know, when you don't think about the method of delivery, so you could have, you know, some, a lot of investments made into, you know, figuring out what the best model is, and you spend a lot of time uh, iterating over that, uh, but you chose or you didn't think about how you deliver those insights to a non-technical person. Uh, in this case, it could be a sales representative who's supposed to make decisions based on your insights that are analytically driven, but they're all lost in, in some sort of report that they can uh, you know, make use of it or make it actionable. And in those cases, you'll see that there's a huge adoption issue. Uh, and when that happens, it, it kind of questions you know, the, even the existence of your department um, to begin with. So it is important to, you know, it's actually better to have a mediocre data science solution with the right method of delivery uh, than a more complex one where you know, investments are made in every, you know, uh, you know, every part of the process and you kind of miss on, the, on how you plan to deliver these insights, uh, and it could, it, it, it could uh, lead to you know, lack of adoption and, and, and also trust uh, whether these analytics even mean anything for your end customer. So if we try to you know, go back and try to deep dive into the sales rep here, uh, and we think about how we want to optimize the method of delivery here uh, so that we can you know, activate some of these analytics and insights that data science teams produce, uh, one of the approaches here to do that is you know, data science team collectively working together, sending insights to your customer, uh, and then when it approaches your end user, in this case, which is the rep, which you're trying to change their behavior, you, wanna, you would want to take that omni-channel approach where data is shared across all of their devices and it's connected across different devices. Uh, it's real-time, it's synced, so that you can send the predictive insights you know, in, uh, at the right time, the right frequency, uh, it is shared in a small dosage fashion, fashion because you're trying, to, you're trying to change their behavior to take your recommendation versus their gut instinct. So having this sort of like uh, closed channel where all devices are always available and interconnected, uh, you can solve for that if you have the right method of delivery. So you have really designed um, uh, you know, a set of tools here to really uh, activate your insights. Um, to, to actually change the decision for, for a sales rep. And when that happens, some of the outcomes here we would notice is you would have higher engagement. You have, uh, also you have kind of like reinforced the strategies that are coming from headquarters and finally delivering to the end uh, user that's on the ground. And we also see this interaction effect that happens between one of the drivers, which is the sales rep, but now because you have given them all of these tools that are interconnected, they're also able to have a uh, a way to interact with other channels. So for example, if you're a sales rep, you go to a physician's office and you have uh, a conversation, you can also absorb some of their concerns the physicians are having about patient uh, you know, adherence to the medicine or some of the problems their own patients are, are facing, and then you can walk out of that office and quickly fire off an email campaign that gives the physician uh, the right content that they were concerned about that's also compliant and, and, and approved. So you have this multi-channel interaction that's happening because of your approach and how you're delivering some of these insights. So I think the key thing here is the business context around pushing the right information to the driver, in this case, which is the sales rep, at the right time to influence their decision through small nudges. So you know, based on where they are, what they're doing, who they're seeing, you can actually nudge them through a phone or through your, uh, your iWatch and, and kind of tell them that here's the next best action or here's the next best position to call and why and provide them that context. So you've connected your data science team in-house, internal, all the way down to the field uh, that's, that's out there. So I think for us, um, you know, when we were doing this kind of exercise, you know, a native solution was the right method of delivery in this, in, in this uh, situation to really activate the insights. 
So I'm going to pass it over to Damien to kind of cover some of the technical aspects. Thank you. So usually the best tools actually start with a very simple POC. And R and Shiny as are just the best tool to actually start quickly, start early, and iterate fast. And I would like to share with you the development approach that can lead you to having an offline application that is uh, fully native uh, and uh, is using the R technology that you are using to build your models. So usually when you start with a simple R Shiny POC, you can iterate very quickly because of the Shiny capabilities. And then at some point, uh, with the feedback of your users, you can create an application that is ready to go to production. And when you deploy the application and scale it well, this is the right moment for you to think about extracting an API. And the great part about it is that this API can be used not only in the native application, but you can use it actually anywhere that you want. And this builds a whole ecosystem of uh, applications that you can build around your data. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the native iPad application that is just one part of the whole ecosystem. And the great thing about it is that actually you can reuse the backend, the JavaScript, and the style sheets that you created in the first iterations. I would like to focus on three elements that you need to actually build a successful application. First one, I will talk about scaling, then I will talk about Plumber API, and uh, at the end, we will talk about the native application. So let's start with scaling. In order to scale your Shiny application and uh, be successful in production, you need to follow very simple rules to have a good application architecture. First of all, try to extract the computations from the server. As you know, R is single-threaded, and you, to, you need to make sure that you, not, you don't put too much load on the server while it is running. So you can use the database, you can run the ETLs, you can extract the processes away from the app, and just trigger those processes and go back to the main thread. Also, you should make Shiny layer thin. Shiny is a great middleware that connects front-end with the back-end, and this is great for communication. Then, you should leverage front-end. JavaScript is a perfect tool. It actually allows you to uh, create great interactions, and sometimes you don't need even to communicate with the back-end to do some uh, amazing uh, actions uh, on the front-end. So when you have the right architecture, there is a time to deploy your application to RStudio Connect. Uh, RStudio Connect is great not only because you get the authentication, but actually it automatically scales all the processes uh, behind, so it is capable to serve as many users as it, is, as it is possible on one single machine. But of course, sometimes it is not enough to have just one machine serving all your users, especially if you have an application that has a thousand users. And you have seen um, last year that Sean Loop was talking about even scaling to 10,000 users. So this is not possible on a very small one machine. So in order to do that, I suggest to have a very good preparation first. We often use Ansible that allows you to actually automate the process of installing all the software and deploying it on RStudio Connect. So when you have a bare metal or you just spin up an instance in the cloud, you can just one, run one single command and uh, deploy everything, provision, install all of the requirements, and it just works. So when you have that, you can create an architecture that will allow you to serve uh, a lot of users. You can scale as much as you want. You just add additional servers. The only thing that you need to remember is that you need to have a load balancer with a sticky session in front of it. Now, the thing that excites me the most when it comes to RStudio Connect is the fact that not only can you deploy a Shiny application here, but actually you are able to deploy the Plumber API. So once you build the whole infrastructure and you serve a Shiny application uh, within your team or outside, you are now able to just add simple pl Plumber API endpoints and they are going to just work on the same infrastructure just next to your Shiny application. So let's look at Plumber API. Probably most of you already know Plumber, so I'm just going to briefly tell you how it works. Plumber is a package from uh, our studio, and it allows you to simply change a function into an HTTP uh, API. So when you look at the example here, you have a function that has uh, arguments A and B, and it returns just a sum of those two. By adding simple annotations in the comments, you are able to create an endpoint that uh, when the whole project is uh, deployed, you can just uh, call, for example, CURL and pass the data as a post to get the result. So now, when we have the whole infrastructure and we have uh, the Plumber API endpoints that serve the data to you, this is the, probably the hardest part, so the native application. 
The problem is that we are not able to build a whole native application with uh, Shiny, but as you are advanced uh, Shiny developers, you already probably have uh, worked with JavaScript as well. So the good news is that you can leverage your JavaScript skills or the skills within your team to actually create a native application using the React Native uh, package and library. So React Native is a library that is created and maintained by Facebook, and it actually allows you to create fully native applications just using the JavaScript. So let me quickly tell you how React works by itself. React creates an HTML structure within the web browser, and it is waiting for any events in, in, uh, in the JavaScript event loop. So let's say the action is that we want to change the word world to React. What React does in the behind the scenes is uh, creating the new version of the HTML structure that we want to apply. It checks what is the difference between those two, and it applies only the diff to the result. So you do not re-render everything, you just change one simple component within your application. Now what is great is that when you learn React, then you will be able to use React Native just uh, just right away, because it works exactly the same way. It has a React, uh, it has a JavaScript event loop uh, running on the iPad, on iPhone, on uh, any Android device, for example. And the only thing that it does, it actually does exactly the same. It checks what has changed and it applies the change, but it is a real native component. So to show you the final architecture that you would have in order to have such an offline solution, is on the left you have the scaled architecture where you have Plumber API deployed on RStudio Connect, as well as the Shiny application that you have been using. And then to the right you have uh, your iPads that are actually running React Native in the background and are showing the fully native application that is syncing the data with your Plumber API endpoints. Now, what is great about this is that when the device goes offline, it actually still works because there is a local store that you can save to and it is up to you to write the code to make it sync well with the uh, endpoints. But then whenever you have people that are traveling, for example, and they don't have much internet, they're not going to uh, see a lot of intermissions because they can just go offline and use the app whenever they want. So that's the technological part of, uh, of building such solution. Uh, but this is not the most difficult part. Uh, of course, uh, making it happen in the business is uh, actually much more difficult as probably all of you know. Uh, so I'm going to pass it on to uh, Ayman to talk about the rest. Thanks, Damien. Yeah, so just last two slides. I know we're almost out of time. Uh, but some of the things I really wanted to share that you can't really Google or, or find out in a tutorial uh, is kind of like how do you implement such a large-scale application which is used by hundreds and hundreds of users on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and, and I kind of put it on, on, out of there on the slide. But I think uh, it is important to make sure that you establish some sort of steering committee and you have uh, uh, you know, senior leadership kind of like bought into your idea. And my, m like in my experience, one of the, the best ways to do it was always create a prototype by yourself in Shiny. So uh, writing uh, a working prototype, uh, an application that they can feel in touch to kind of you know, sell your vision and communicate the message that you're trying to, trying to solve for is, is kind of key. Uh, so uh, you can kind of review this stuff, uh, but I will still end with the same thing that you know, you gotta choose the right method of delivery so that you can really activate some of your analytics and insights that you're investing a lot of time uh, within your data science teams. Uh, thank you. <laughs>